Have you ever wondered how to create a portrait painting using just four colors? Well, in this video, we're going to take a look at exactly how to do that. So we're going to use the Zorn Limited Palette to explore some of the flesh tone combinations. But first, let's learn how to mix color using the Zorn Palette. We're going to use just those four colors to mix all of these colors and I'm going to show you exactly how to mix them using a palette knife and this is going to be very uh, useful information to take with us as we move on to the painting demonstration. All right, so our first color combination is going to be cadmium red and ivory black in just about equal parts. So that's going to give us our first almost like a burnt umber color. Next, we're going to do the same thing with a little more red and then progressively using more and more red and less ivory black. Now, just cadmium red. This is just cadmium red at this point. Now we're going to mix cadmium red a little bit of our white and some yellow ochre. We're going to add the yellow ochre only after putting the white and that white that I'm using is uh, zinc white. So that is white, red, and yellow ochre to create a kind of half orange. Now we're going to combine our yellow ochre and a little bit of ivory black. So yellow ochre, a little bit of ivory black to give us a nice deep yellow and now just yellow ochre so that was just yellow ochre and now we're going to combine yellow ochre with our white so yellow ochre and white and again you can use any white that you want you could use titanium white you can use lead white traditionally it was lead white but any white will do so we're going to be using now yellow and black a little more ivory black than yellow ochre for the green and now we're going to make a dark green so same colors just with a little more of the ivory black and now we're going to create our blue so we're mixing ivory black with white and there you have it those are the simple hue combinations but what about value now let's talk a little bit about flesh tones. So now we're mixing the same colors. So basically the red and the yellow and the ivory black. And now we're going to start progressively adding more and more white. So let's just make the same color, but adding more and more white each time. So let's just go ahead and skip to the portion where we have all of the mixtures progressively adding more white and that's going to be very similar to some of the flesh tones that you're going to mix now let's do the same thing again so it's going to be the red and the ivory black but a little bit more red and now we're going to add a little bit of yellow ochre into this mixture and now we're going to start to vary the value with more and more white. So we're going to create a little value scale of the same color, just adding more and more white. And I would suggest using a transparent white for this. So if you have a flake white or a zinc white, those would work very nicely. All right, so that's our little value scale. So again, the same thing, just red and yellow, just red and yellow to make a deep, rich, red and now we're going to progressively add more and more white so let's go ahead and add more and more white and let's just do the same thing following down all we did was just add more and more white to the same type of color combination now we have just red and white so this is going to be your pink this is going to be located very notably on lips, nostrils, those areas like that. You'd be surprised at how bright of a pink you can get with cadmium red and white. So now the same kind of thing. So we're going to mix our red and our yellow to get an orange. And then we're going to make that orange lighter and lighter with the white. And these are going to be very, very close to the types of flesh tones that you'll see throughout this painting. So let's just keep mixing more white into the orange. 
And doing this with a palette knife is uh, preferred, I would say, because it's easier to keep your color combinations clean. So there you have it, just adding more and more white into that mixture. Now let's go ahead and jump into the portrait painting demonstration. And here we have our model, Julius. And I'm gonna keep an image of him to the top left corner of your screen so you can refer to it as the painting develops. Now, if at any point in this video you become curious as to what materials I'm using, I'm going to have all of that information typed up for you in the description box below. So go ahead, feel free to scroll down to the bottom and you'll be able to see a list of exactly what materials I'm using. So I'm using a approximately size 2 filbert bristle brush as my drawing brush. And I'm just combining the red and the black. So just red and black, very similar to the first color you saw me mix with the palette knife. But it's going to have a tiny bit more of the black. So I'm going to go ahead and start to block in the portrait. So I'm going to start off with a very loose and simplistic portrait sketch using uh, just red and black. So this is very similar to an umber sketch. And if you've seen my previous videos, this is very much how I start uh, if I want to work in a very quick manner. So I'm going to be using a few simple straight lines and angles. So here is a approximately where I think the edge of his face is going to be and the edge of his face to the other side somewhere around here and again nothing's really set in stone I'm just trying to figure out the placement at this point it is the where does stuff fit phase I just want to get an idea of where everything is going to fit now I will say that I'm using a tiny bit of mineral spirits on the brush to get the paint to flow a little bit more easily, but not using that much mineral spirits, just a tiny little bit of mineral spirits. And so now we're making this little angle across strong straight line to give me uh, where I think the shoulder is going to be. Notice how I'm holding the brush from the edge. So I'm holding the brush from the edge uh, pretty much the furthest distance back and kind of working with my arm extended so I can get an idea of the big picture, working very simplistic. I'm not trying to create a finished outline at this stage. I'm just trying to get an idea of placement. If I can get the head placed where I want it to be in say the first 10 minutes or so, I'm in a good place. So now I'm going to start to etch in this little rectangular shape here, and this is going to be for the axes of the eyes and the axes of the eyebrows. And now we're going to start to put in the center line. So noting that the center line is telling me that the head is turned in three quarter. So it's turned in three quarter relative to me. A little closer to prof no, a little closer to centered, I would say. Um, but I can't really tell. I think it's exactly three quarter, to be honest. So now we're starting to put in some little indications here for the eye sockets. So here's a little simple rectangular shape. And now let's put in a strong plane change here for the forehead. And it's also a little shadow shape as well. Notice how very loose and simplistic these marks are. Sometimes you'll see me create a transfer drawing with a very meticulous drawing start. And uh, I like to do that once in a while. And then sometimes I like to go in with a drawing brush in this manner and just sketch. Just create a lot of simplistic straight lines and angles. Now let's look at this little shape here for the uh, side plane of the face. It's the side plane of the face, but it's also uh, kind of already giving me an indication of the uh, cast shadow or should I say the shadow on the side of the face. So we can actually refer to it as a form shadow as well. So now let's just get a little uh, more specific here with the outside shape. So let's get a little piece of paper towel. So this is a Viva brand paper towel, the one that's kind of like cloth. And let's just carve along the side. So let's actually apply a tiny bit of mineral spirits 
onto the paper towel. And I'm going to emphasize the word tiny because I'm using a very small amount of mineral spirits on the paper towel. Now, if you want to be very careful with this, then you might want to use gloves because of the mineral spirits. But I applied such a, such a small amount of mineral spirits onto the paper towel. I really don't think that I have to be that concerned. So now let's just go ahead and just carve a little bit on the outside shape. Now let's switch back to the drawing brush. And let's just put a little shape in there for the mouth. Not really sure where it's going to fit, to be honest. I'm just trying to place a simple little shape for where I think the mouth is going to fit. And this is a very uh, loose and expressive way of starting a portrait painting. You can always make it more and more refined later, or you can start more and more refined. And if you've seen my previous videos, there was one series where I actually uh, spent the entire first video on the pencil drawing, the outline, and then started to progressively uh, create an underpainting and all of that. And this is basically an abbreviated version of a more classical approach. So now let's go ahead and put in a little dark shape here for the nose. Notice how it starts off very simple, almost like a rectangle for the nose. And for the eye sockets, let's go ahead and just carve a little shape right about here. I think that's about right. So that's going to be the uh, glabella, the shape for the glabella. And the glabella is the middle between the two eye sockets. Now let's go ahead and let's take a look at this shape. Let's say that goes about there. Not sure if that's entirely where it needs to be, but it's a start. Just trying to get a handle on these simple shapes. Now let's go ahead and carve a little bit more for the bottom. Switching back to the drawing brush. Now let's create a little indication here for the shirt. So I'm also thinking composition at this point. I'm thinking that I'm going to place a little bit of information for the shirt and maybe a little bit of background color, but not much more than that. This is really more about how to use the Zorn palette. So again, red and black, very much in, uh, I'd say equal parts, but uh, to be honest, I think there's a little more ivory black into this mixture, but just red and black for the drawing color. Red, so cadmium red and ivory black. And I will say I'm using cadmium red medium. Cadmium red medium, I'm not using cadmium red light. I'm actually using cadmium red medium, but cadmium red light would work just as well too. And you can also use uh, Venetian red for uh, as a substitute for cadmium red as well. But in any case, let's carve a little shape there. So we just carved in a little bit of light for the sclera of the eye to the left of your screen. Kind of cut that in a little bit uh, too wide. So I started compensating for that by drawing in the iris of the eye and a little shape for the bottom of the eye socket. Now I guess it's time to start to etch in the little shape of the cast shadow using very little trace amounts of mineral spirits, almost none, almost zero mineral spirits, very tiny bit of mineral spirits. And so now look at the eye to the right of your screen. It's kind of messed up. I think it needs to get a little bit lower. So let's go ahead with the paper towel. We just erased a little mark to angle it further down. So let's see if that angle is correct. Now let's just bounce back to the other eye socket and then just carve in a little simple plane change there for the side of the nose. And we're creating a little plane change using the paper towel. Very much just, very much like a sketch. Treating this just like a sketch. Very loose, very simplistic. And I don't always work this way. I tend to, I try to be an explorer when it comes to the uh, approaches in portrait painting. I'm not going to tell you you must stick to this one way and this one way is the only way that you can create a portrait. 
I just don't think that that's fun. I think it's it's fun to explore a variety of different approaches, some more realistic, some more expressive, others more colorful, others more monochrome. I love all of it. And now let's go ahead and put in a little dark shape here for the bottom of the nose, just a little dark shape there. Who knows if that's where it's going to be, but let's just put that in there. Now, let's look at the uh, little side, side value here. So with a little more ivory black, probably too much ivory black, so I'm gonna go back with the paper towel and pretty much a clean portion of the paper towel. I'm just spreading the ivory black and the cadmium red. And it's at this point that I should mention that ivory black and cadmium red are extremely slow dryers. They dry really slow. So I would recommend uh, if you're going to use a medium, which I'm gonna be using when I get into color, use a fast drying medium, something like your Liquin, or your uh, Gamblin makes one called Galkid. Uh, but what I'll be using is a medium called uh, Neo McGilt. And I think it's also produced by Gamblin. Don't quote me on that. I think it is produced by Gamblin. But Neo McGilt is a nice fast dryer. Uh, but I didn't use the medium yet. And I will only use the medium when I start to add uh, more layers of color. In any case, I'm going to use a little more of the cadmium red, a little more cadmium red and ivory black. Again, cadmium red, ivory black together are very similar to a burnt umber. A burnt umber, which is what I usually use as a drawing color. Sometimes I'll use raw umber. Raw umber is a little bit more greenish usually uh, than burnt umber. But in any case, I just recharged that drawing color on my palette. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the little shape of the eye socket on the corner here. Let's go ahead and make a big, bold, brave brush mark. Come back in with the paper towel. And we just, let's carve that shape. Try to make it a little bit more specific. Just add a tiny bit more specificity. And now you can notice I'm holding the brush kind of in the middle now. So if I'm holding the brush in the middle, you can tell I'm going to start to subdivide the shapes into tinier and tinier shapes. Now let's look at the bottom of the chin. Now let's look at the side of the neck. I'm not very confident about this little shape here, so I'm going to erase part of it for the back side of the neck. That looks about right. Now let's just move the bottom of the ear. Notice how very... Uh, malleable and fluid this drawing is at this stage. Malleable and fluid meaning that I can move the shapes around uh, with a lot of facility. It's very simple to move a shape to the left or to the right if you keep your shapes very simple and minimalistic uh, to start with. Now let's go ahead and etch in a little bit more for the cast shadow of the side of the face, just let the brush roam free, very much just treating this like a sketch. And let's look at the bottom shape there. Let's subtract a little. So let's use a brush to look at the angles. So the angle of the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Here's our caliper. So I'm just looking at the length of the forehead, comparing that to the length of the nose, and then comparing that of the nose down to the chin. Now let's go ahead and top of the hairline to the chin and make a horizontal. All right, so that is telling me that I made the head a little bit too wide for the length of the head. So again, with the paper towel, very easy, just cutting in on the side of the corner, just cutting in a little simple shape. That's why I usually say, if you keep your shape simple and easy uh, for you to understand, when the time comes, or if the time comes to make any changes, those changes will also be simple and easy to understand. But I should also say that those changes will be simple and easy to manage. Now, I'm not going to stress out too much about creating a perfect 
photographically looking resolved portrait. Uh, I'm going to explore the Zorn palette and just have fun with the paint. And so let's go ahead and jump right into some uh, flesh tone mixtures. So very similar to what you saw earlier in this video, I'm making a combination of my red and yellow. First I mix the red and the yellow, and then I put in some ivory black. And the reason for the ivory black is to neutralize the heat of the uh, red and yellow combination. And again, the, the red I'm using is cadmium red medium. And I believe it's Gamblin's cadmium red medium. But in any case, all of the materials that I'm using, including the brushes, will be typed in the description box below. Uh, so go ahead, and if you're curious at this point as to what brushes I'm using or exactly what paints I'm using, that information is going to be typed in the description box for you. And I also received a question about how I set up my palette. And so the palette is actually just a sheet of glass that's spray painted on the back side with some uh, gray spray paint. And so I have my panel pretty much just resting on that, and that's how I set up the palette. Now then, I'm using the color to place in a little division between the light and the shadow. And I also put in some accent marks uh, for the side of the corner of the eye socket and the side of the wing of the nose. And now let's go ahead and put in a little accent mark uh, for the ear and the side of the eye socket to the right of your screen. And now let's put in a little accent mark here for the little side plane of the neck. So what we're doing with this color is creating kind of a dark light, or should I say pretty much just a dark half tone, uh, because the dark light, we'll get into that later, the dark light is going to be the division between light and shadow. Even though that's where I placed my first flesh tone, I'm not saying that that's the dark light, I'm just saying that that's a half tone that I'm starting off with. And now I'm going to be introducing a little bit more yellow ochre into the mixture. Now again, very similar to what you saw in the color mixing portion of this video. Same kind of thing. I used the cadmium red and the yellow ochre first to get me a kind of neutral orange. And then I actually took what was on the brush uh, and just added a little bit more of the zinc white. So again, I'm using zinc white for these flesh tones. I actually don't prefer zinc white. I actually kind of like lead white or flake white, but I'm using zinc white because it's a nice and simple uh, transparent white to work with. Now then, exactly like what you saw on the color mixing portion of this video. Just using more zinc white to raise the value and I'm also introducing a little bit more of the cadmium red. So there's a little more cadmium red in this little area and this is going to be the large plane of the cheeks. And the reason I'm developing this painting in this way is because we're going to sculpt out the planes very similar to a clay sculpture. You can imagine these simple chops as plane changes on a large piece of clay. And now let's talk about what a plane is. So a plane is essentially my panel in the light source. A plane is essentially my palette in the light source, meaning it's just an it's just a conceptualization of a flat surface in three-dimensional space and that flat surface will always have a given angle with respect to a light source and that angle that the plane has with respect to the light source is going to determine what value changes we need to apply to create the illusion of form and so that's what we're doing right now actually we're using a darker flesh tone and again the color combination is extremely similar to what we had for the half tones, just pretty much the red and yellow to create the orange with the uh, zinc white to raise the value. And then when we want to go darker, combining the red and the ivory black. So now let's just add a little bit more cadmium red and some, some more zinc white. So a little bit more zinc white. And if you'll notice, uh, that zinc white is actually starting to fall off the palette, but that's okay. It's, it doesn't fall off the palette completely, but it's just kind of funny to notice that the zinc white is actually creeping down. And uh, that's just because zinc white is kind of grainy. The one that I'm using is 
uh, Winsor and Newton's zinc white. Now, um, if you have a limited palette that you prefer to use, uh, let us know in the comments section below. Go ahead and type what your favorite limited palette is to use. Mine just happens to be the Zorn palette, but what's your favorite limited palette? I'd like to hear from you. Now, let's go ahead and add in a little bit more ivory black. So now we're adding in some cooler and darker notes. Note just means kind of an abbreviated shape, which is what we're doing, abbreviated shapes of color. So the darker shape was for the mustache, and with a little bit more ivory black and cadmium red, we're going to get a kind of dark red, but it's kind of it's kind of close to lavender almost, or maybe burgundy. Let's say that it's closer to burgundy. Now we're just going to create this as a flat color mass and add in a dark red accent. So let's go ahead and add a dark red accent dark red accent, and this is actually where I would use my Alizarin Crimson Permanent if I had it, because Alizarin Crimson Permanent is a really good tinter, uh, tinting something that's dark red-ish. So the Alizarin would have made it a nice tinted red, but instead we're going to have a deep, uh, rich red using the Cadmium Red, and it works pretty much just as well. Now let's go ahead and place in some more of the facial hair for the bottom using a little bit more ivory black into the mixture. And with ivory black and cadmium red, it kind of creates a sort of velvety neutral purple kind of color. It's only when you combine uh, cadmium red yellow ochre into the ivory black that you get a kind of neutral warm color. Now then, let's go and paint in some lighter planes. So we used a little bit of uh, our white combined with our yellow ochre. So for the light planes, I'm kind of sticking to white and yellow ochre primarily, and then just tinting it a little bit more red uh, with the cadmium red. And I'm just gonna take what's on the brush here and just go ahead and just etch in these plane changes for the neck. Very fast, simple, and easy. Just cutting in these plane changes very simply. I'm not trying to make a perfectly photographic image. I'm just trying to paint in these shapes and explore the properties of the oil paint with the Zorn palette. And at this point, I'm not using any medium at all yet. But when I get into the medium, I will let you know. And so let's go ahead and just add in, and this is very much just dry brushing. Just add in this light plane. So dry brushing again just means not using any medium or mineral spirits. This is just the oil paint on its own. So a little bit more yellow ochre into the mixture for the lighter planes on the cheek. And let's just add a little bit more cadmium red. Now I know some of you are probably not happy with the fact that I'm not using the palette knife to mix the colors for the flesh tones. My apologies, I just like mixing color with a brush. I just, that's my preference. I like mixing colors with the brush. But if you want to see me create more uh, paintings using a palette knife to create uh, flesh tones throughout the painting, go ahead and let me know in the comments and I'll do what I can for you. But I will say I do enjoy mixing color uh, with the brush. So now a little more of the cadmium red and yellow ochre to create a type of simplistic halftone. Now let's go ahead and add in a, a little bit more cadmium red and ivory black into this mixture. Now I'm kind of using the drawing brush that I had before just because it already had a similar color and we're just using it to paint in these dark accents. Very simple and easy dark accents. And I tell you what, if you wanna know what are the most efficient accent marks to place in. So remember an accent is very very much what I just put in right there. So an accent is just for the side of the kind of the darkest shapes. Try to look from your peripheral vision. Try to look from your peripheral vision, blur your eyes or even squint your eyes and uh, distorting 
the image in that way kind of actually will help you see what the most important accent marks will be. Now let's go ahead and uh, add just a little bit more of this little half tone here. So notice this little combination of the cadmium red and the ivory black mixing right onto the uh, colors on the palette. And I like to mix the colors right on top of each other on the palette. It just helps me get a type of understanding of where I am on the value scale. So just a simple little flat plane there for the bulb of the nose. And you may be thinking, man, this looks nothing like the photo reference. What are you doing? And uh, let's just face it, we're portrait painters. We're painters. I think it's, it's important to hold on to the abstract, to know how to use the abstract, and not get too caught up with the literal all the time. The literal meaning the perfect outline for the side of the face. Let's enjoy the experience. I'm trying to give you a journey. I'm trying to guide you through the reality of creating a portrait painting, not how to copy a photograph. That's just not what I'm about. I'm about guiding you through the experience involved in creating paintings. Now then, let's just create a little burgundy cool note for the side of the bottom of the eye socket. And again, at this point, I'm taking colors right off of that little puddle that we uh, created for the color mixtures on the palette. Very simple little burgundy color mixture. And there's nothing mysterious about these colors, nothing out of this world about these colors. And I tell you one thing, I'm not trying to make the colors as hot or as orange as the photo reference. So I'm not copying the photo reference. I'm creating a painting, a painting that is inspired by nature. So inspired by what I'm looking at, but it also has a bit of freedom to it that's not solely copying the photograph. Now let's go ahead with the palette knife. Remember I said that that zinc white was going to be creeping down? Tell you what, if you want to go back to the uh, when I started this painting and just scroll through really fast, it's going to be pretty funny because you're going to see that uh, zinc white just creeping its way down. Kind of funny stuff, right? So now with the palette knife, I'm just taking the paint out. So I'm just moving it to the side and I'm going to create another mixture of flesh tones with a varying tonality. So again, I'm going to be using the white and the yellow ochre first because the lightest planes look very warm to me. So just white, yellow ochre first. And now I'm just tinting that a little bit with the cadmium red medium. So that's going to be for my lightest lights. Now let's go ahead and combine the cadmium red, the white, and the yellow ochre. And it is at this point that I'm actually using a little bit of my medium. Remember I told you I would let you know when I'm using medium? Yeah, I'm using medium right now. So all I did was just dip the brush into the Neo McGilp. It's a gel-like medium, and that's it. That's all I did to apply the medium. And so now I'm working my way down the value scale, and um, and these color mixtures are starting to kind of look like the colors that we created in the beginning of this video when we were learning how to mix colors with the Zorn palette. So pretty cool stuff. Very simple color combinations can create some of the most elegant uh, flesh tones. So I think that's about... That's about right for my value scale. Now let's look at these three brushes. So these are going to be the brushes that I'm going to use uh, for the smaller plane changes. And so I started off with some larger brushes. The video I made last week was a big brush, little brush. And uh, that's where I kind of introduced the idea of creating those large plane changes with a large brush and then progressively uh, making uh, smaller and smaller plane changes using uh, 
progressively smaller and smaller brushes. And so now this is pretty much the drawing brush. Actually, this is the brush that I used for the initial drawing. And I'm just going to use it again just to sketch in this little shape here for the hair. Now, another thing I will say is that uh, oil paint tends to create a bit of a glare. Uh, so that's why I, I use that large brush that you just saw. That was my large fan brush, but unfortunately that fan brush is kind of beat up. So uh, I'm trying not to use that fan brush too much because it kind of takes off some of the paint. But depending on the direction that you apply the brush stroke, so in this case I'm applying kind of diagonal brush strokes. Notice how I'm applying the brush stroke in this angle. It helps to cut back on the glare. Now we're going into some of the darker flesh tone mixtures. So I'm using a combination of the uh, cadmium red and the ivory black. So a little bit more cadmium red than ivory black. Notice how I mixed right on top of the corresponding area of the value scale. So I would like to call this a working value scale on my palette. That is, the value scale helps me keep track of where I am in terms of my relative value mixtures, but at the same time, I can always adjust the color combinations on my palette, just like you saw me do, by uh, making the colors warmer or cooler or however I want to modify them. Now I'm just looking at the corner of the side plane of the forehead, very much like a sculpture, just carving away at the side of the forehead. And just kind of patting down the paint now. I'm just trying to minimize the glare and at the same time apply a, a clean value transition. Now I'm going in with the uh, yellow ochre and the cadmium red and I'm taking off of that little uh, bit of paint that I used or that I obtained from scraping off the colors previously. So just patting down the colors and this is my favorite brush I've got to say. I've used this brush for so many painting videos and uh, unfortunately this brush is really nearing the end of its life but I'm going to keep pushing on with this brush until it can't apply any more paint. And uh, if you want to know what my favorite brush is, this is the one. So this is the green brush and if you go to the link in the description below, I'll have it listed as the green brush so you know exactly which brush I'm using. And remember, no one pays me to advertise any materials. So uh, when I tell you I like a material, it's not because anyone's telling me to tell you that. It's because I want you to benefit from my experience with the materials. Now let's make a little warmer half tone. So I added in a tiny bit more of the cadmium red. And this is kind of the a way that I'm going to be juggling these colors. I'm going to be uh, asking myself, is, is it warmer? Is it cooler? Is it more red? Is it more green? So the side plane of the nose is a little bit more on the red side. So now let's go ahead to the lighter region of the palette. And I'm going to use a little more of the kind of like orange-ish mixture for the top of the uh, top plane of the nose just below the nasal bone. Now we're painting in a little uh, light here directly below the nasal bone. Now let's go ahead to the lighter lights. Just put in a little highlight there. That should be uh, somewhere around the location of the nasal bone. Remember the nasal bone usually rests a little bit higher than the uh, tear ducts. So now let's just paint in a little simple shape there for the glabella. Very simple, almost triangular looking shape. And now a little soft edge here. So I get a lot of questions about edges. And um, to be honest, I really don't think about edges until the end. Now I know a lot of artists might be like, what are you saying? You don't think about edges? And uh, that's just because I can soften them or make them sharper in the later portions of the, uh, the painting. I'm much more focused 
on the shapes and the value changes. But I am trying to consider this little edge right here on the corner of the side of the mandible. This little shadow shape here. So let's go ahead and actually just sharpen that edge just so it's a little easier to note. Now putting in another dark accent for the side of the eye socket. And it, it is at this point that we're going to label this as like large form modeling. So we're modeling the form via large planes. So now we're adding a little bit more cadmium red right onto that region of the palette. And the reason I like to mix the colors right on top of the palette is because it helps me neutralize my color changes uh, because I don't want anything that's overly bright or overly saturated. I kind of prefer uh, flesh tones that are closer to lifelike. So let's go ahead and cut in a little shape here for the bottom of the chin. And it's still looking kind of like a mess, but I'm starting to kind of apply more plain changes. And then with a tiny brush, we're going to bring this all together. Now let's go in with a little more light here for the bottom of the chin. And let's just get, from, get some color here from the uh, dark halftone region of the palette. And I'm really trying to show you the, I'm, tr I'm trying to give you the experience of using the Zorn palette. So that's part of the reason why I'm painting in this way. So you see these large plane changes. And at the same time, there's a lot of freedom in the way that uh, we're creating this painting. We're not concerned about uh, it being a commission painting. We're not concerned about the model uh, looking at the painting and saying, oh gosh, what have you done to me? Or we're not worried about uh, someone coming by and saying, hmm, I wonder what he was thinking. Instead, we're trying to build these color shapes and these color, uh, you can also use the term color relationships. All right, so enough with the flat shapes. Now let's get into these smaller shapes now. So this is gonna be the little corner here for the tear duct. So there's gonna be a simple little shape there for the tear duct and let's follow through to the other side of the eye and place in a simple dark accent there. Now let's go ahead and just uh, change this little edge here. Now if you notice, we're using smaller brushes now that we're getting into the smaller shapes. Now let's go ahead and paint in a little bit of light here for the sclera. And remember the sclera should be a little bit cooler than the surrounding flesh tones. Just a little bit cooler. Meaning that there's a little more of the ivory black, so a little more influence of the ivory black and the white in the sclera of the eye. Remember the sclera of the eye is also uh, kind of a half tone. You would expect it to be a very light light, but oftentimes it's very much a half tone. Now let's go ahead and look at this little transition of value. Remember the sclera is also kind of like a like a sphere, right? The eyeball is like a sphere. So as the sphere turns further and further away from the light, it gets progressively darker. So that's what we did for the sclera of the eye. Now let's go. We just painted in a little dark shape there for the bottom portion of the lower eyelid. Just sculpting away, adding in these little plane changes. And it's a little darker near the tear duct because that form is turning away from the light as it approaches the tear duct and then turns back in towards the light. So it's a little bit lighter here. So we're trying to create a little simple passage of form. And again, not really trying to copy uh, the photograph in front of me, rather just trying to create basically uh, understanding or trying to show an understanding of these plane changes. Now a little bit of light here. So a little bit of the the white with a tiny bit of the ivory black will give us a nice cool color for the highlight. So that's the highlight on the iris. Now let's go ahead and reevaluate this little dark shape here. 
So let's go ahead and carve. Remember, I'm kind of applying the brush strokes in a horizontal fashion, and that is for no other reason uh, than I'm just trying to not have glare. So that's why I'm applying and the brush strokes in a horizontal fashion. Notice even on the little light here for the eyelid. Now a little tip to uh, apply wet on wet transitions of color, which is what we're doing here. So we're applying a wet layer of paint on top of another wet layer of paint. Uh, so one tip is to use little to no medium in your first layer. Notice how the paint's nicely sticking onto the surface. So use little to no medium first, and then as you apply more and more layers, uh, painting wet on wet, use more and more medium. Remember the medium uh, is called Neo McGilp, and it's a fast dryer. And again, uh, the Zorn palette consists of two colors that are extremely slow drying and that is the cadmium red and the ivory black. Those are very slow drying colors. So that's why I would recommend uh, using a fast dryer as your medium. And now we're just softening these little transitions here and uh, at the same time kind of softening the edge between the form of the uh, high lit regions of the eye socket and the side of the concavity of the eye socket. Now let's go ahead and paint in a lighter plane in here. Notice how the paint is nicely sticking on. So again, it's because I'm using thinner paint over top of thicker paint to paint wet on wet uh, passages of paint. And now let's go ahead and uh, make this plane change a little bit more evident, a little bit lighter. So we used a little bit more yellow ochre and cadmium red to that region of color. And again, I'm not trying to make it as bright uh, or as saturated as the photo reference. So that's why I'm making the color changes a little bit cooler. Now let's go ahead and uh, adjust that little edge there. And now let's go in and uh, soften this little shape here on the corner of the concavity of the eye socket. And just softening it with a uh, little light touch. And now I'm applying a darker brush stroke. Now in the comment section I read um, someone ask uh, how could brush strokes make or break a painting? I think that's how the question went. And to be honest, I don't really know how brush strokes or the application of brush strokes could break a painting. Now the uh, calligraphy in uh, many old master paintings really emphasizes the usage of uh, the brush stroke. If you look at some later Rembrandts or if you look at some John Singer Sargent's, you really can see a great emphasis on the brush stroke. But then if you really think about it, isn't it what the brush stroke is conveying? Maybe isn't it more important to think about the information given within each brush stroke than to think about the brush stroke itself? So for instance, let's look at this brush stroke there for the bottom of the nose, dark accent there for the bottom of the nose. And that's a very bold application of paint in that area. Even the highlight is a very bold little application of paint. It almost looks like the sun is peeking through there. But the reason that I'm applying these brush strokes in this fashion uh, is very much to cut down on glare. I mean, I'm sorry I can't say anything more uh, sophisticated than I really don't want the painting to glare for my camera. And so that's why I'm applying the paint in a very diagonal fashion. So maybe that does create an interesting uh, effect of brush strokes. Who knows? But one thing I will say is that it's, it's a little more important to think about the information given within a brush stroke than to think about the brush stroke itself. And the, uh, the late uh, Nelson Shanks, one of the best portrait artists of our time, uh, also once mentioned uh, or once compared the brush stroke to the font of a typewriter. 
uh, he would say uh, that he was more interested in the information given in the words than he was focused on the individual font of the typewriter. So think about it as a book. Think about it as, uh, yes, you may like the font in, in a book, but aren't you more interested in the story or in the narrative involved or just in the information given to you in the book than you are in the font of the book? And uh, what are your thoughts and opinions about it? Uh, I would like to know that. And just go ahead and write it in the comment section below. What are your opinions on the application of the brush stroke and how it could make or break a painting? I'd be very curious to hear what you have to say. Now then, uh, with our brush strokes here, you can see that we're just carving out the cast shadow for the nose and just created a very simple turning plane uh, for the bulb of the nose, just a very simple gradual uh, change in value, very similar to what we did in the early portion of this video. Remember, we were just adjusting the value by adding more and more white. That's basically what we did to build the lights lighter and lighter closer to the highlight. And now you can really see that the form of the nose is starting to take place with those very few and simple brush marks. It really is about making the painting read at a distance, at least for this painting. I'm trying to keep it uh, loose, simple, and uh, simple to understand. Now let's look at a little plain change. This little area beneath the wing of the nose needs to be a little bit brighter. Now let's move to the mouth. And again, thinking about brush strokes, look at all the brush strokes uh, that are left to show on the mouth at this current stage. Now, again, I'm, I'm very much thinking of this plane change here on the corner of the side of the mouth. And I'm thinking about this value transition. Notice how I'm switching to a different value. And I'm applying the brush stroke in a horizontal fashion. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm applying the brush stroke in a horizontal fashion uh, because I'm trying to cut back on the glare. Uh, oil paint will inevitably glare, but I'm trying to cut back on how much it glares uh, so you can get more out of uh, the painting footage and not have to deal too much with glare. I know that there's still some glare showing, but I'm doing the best that I can with that. And now you can really see how simple and abstract the shapes of color are with the mouth. Very simple little indication there for the highlight of the lower lip. And I'm trying to keep it loose and abstract. And again, the color combinations are not all that difficult. And it's amazing that we can create all of these intricate little color changes uh, with just four colors and again th the light pink like I mentioned before on the lips is again just the cadmium red and the white very nice and broad prismatic color range that we can get out of just four colors and if you can do this with four colors imagine what you can do with 20 or so colors It'd be out of this world how many colors you can create. But always remember, it's about, if you're trying to create form in a painting, it's all about the value. Now let's look at this little light here for the filtrum. So I'm trying to paint in a little bit of a light. Remember the filtrum is that teardrop looking shape uh, connecting the root of the nose, that is the middle of the bottom of the nose, and the upper region of the middle of the lip. So that is the filtrum shape. Now let's go ahead and look at this little uh, boundary. So this is kind of the side plane of the uh, orbicularis oris and at the same time it's the uh, little dark shape for the mustache. And what's the orbicularis oris? What's he talking about? So the orbicularis oris is just a fancy way of saying the shape or the structure of the face that encompasses the mouth. 
Now back to the topic of brush strokes. Let's look at the accent shape for the corner of the mouth. This is a nice little area, just a drop in, just a singular little brush stroke. So let's go ahead and just make it a little darker. So there you have it. That's a nice little area just to put a single little brush stroke down. And at this stage, I'm also, uh, as you can tell, I'm using round brushes. So I like to use round brushes for this stage or the later stages of uh, painting uh, because it gives me a nice, uh, kind of a nice sharp point like uh, graphite. So again, using the round brush for that, but I'm still using my little size two uh, or approximately size two filbert brush in some areas in this uh, corner as well. So I'm looking at the edge now for the facial hair. Notice how we just painted in a few simple loose brush strokes there. So I'm thinking about the edge now for the bottom of the chin. And I'm thinking that I want this edge to be a little bit softer. So I know that um, the shape for the chin is uh, very important, but at the same time, I'm thinking about the edge quality. So that's why I'm softening some edges and sharpening others. So now in this area here, I'm adding a little bit more of the yellow ochre and cadmium red. So just a little bit more light there for the highlight of the chin. And just going to soften the edge even more with a dry brush. Now let's go ahead and add a background to this painting. So I'm gonna be using a greenish color. So very similar to what we did in the beginning of this video where we mixed the colors with the palette knife. Same kind of stuff, just combining yellow ochre and ivory black to give me a nice greenish color. And then adding just a little bit of our um, red and yellow for a kind of uh, more neutral green. So now let's just fill in the rest of the background with this color. And again, as you notice, the oil paint tends to glare. So I'm trying to stick to a horizontal uh, fashion or horizontal direction uh, with the brush strokes simply because I'm trying to cut back on that glare as much as possible. And now we're going to paint in a very simple shape, a very simple dark shape for the hair using just ivory black and a tiny bit of uh, cadmium red. And that was cadmium red mixed with yellow ochre first, then applied uh, the ivory black. And if you're thinking of layering a painting using the Zorn palette, uh, Think very carefully because ivory black, again, is an extremely slow dryer and the hair has the most ivory black in any of the uh, regions of this painting. And so that area of the painting, this area is going to take a very long time to dry. So if you're considering layering the painting, try and give this painting, try and give your painting at least a week to dry before going back into it. And that's even with a fast drying medium. It will take a very long time to dry. So we just used a fan brush uh, a couple of seconds ago just to bring down the glare. Again, it's a constant battle with the glare. And you can really see it now with that uh, horizontal-ish application of paint. So now I'm going to go ahead and try to eliminate the glare again. And let's go ahead and just uh, do that all over again. So I'm just taking color right off of the palette. So just taking flesh tone into the hair to make the shape of the hair. And a very simple little touch there for the hair. I don't want to do too much. Now let's go ahead and move into the uh, clothing. So I'm using pretty much just zinc white and ivory black for this shape. And it does have a tiny bit of the flesh tone in it, but I'd say no more than like 2% of the flesh tone color into this area. Very small. Now then, I'm very much just taking off the palette for these dark shapes. So I took something that was dark and gray-ish off the palette and just used it for this little dark region for the clothing. 
and we're building the vignette. And if you've seen my previous videos, you know what a vignette is. So a vignette, if you don't know, a vignette is an area of the painting that you leave unfinished on purpose, or say, leave less finished on purpose, just to complement the areas of the painting that are more finished. So if you didn't know what that meant, now you know what that means. Now let's go into the uh, little intricacies of the folds on the sweater. So with a uh, healthy amount of zinc white and ivory black, we're just painting in these uh, little light shapes. Now I'm not using straight zinc white, but I'm using mostly zinc white. It's probably 95% zinc white to 5% ivory black. Now let's go ahead and just add a little little touch of value change on this little corner and just soften the edge. Just trying to create these little folds for the clothing. And I don't want to do too much for the, uh, the sweater. So I'm only going to apply a few uh, little plane changes and a few little uh, brush strokes. I'm actually going to let some of those larger brush strokes show in the uh, area of the sweater, uh, just kind of for fun. And then we're going to move on shortly to the ear. And so with the ear, I'm actually just going to place a little bit of light here. Notice how only a little bit of light is showing for the ear. So this is the uh, kind of like, you can think of it as the rim of the ear, also known as the helix of the ear. And there's a little bit of light ramping around the side of the ear. So again, let's switch back to that fan brush just to eliminate some of the glare. And let's paint in a little dark shape here for the tragus of the ear. So the tragus of the ear is that little uh, piece of the... Uh, Basically that little hook looking shape of the ear. Now let's go ahead and uh, paint in a little shape here for the ear lobe. So just a little shape, indication of shape there for the ear lobe. And with this painting I'm not trying to create a perfectly photographic image. I'm pretty much just playing the game of how simple can I make it such that it reads at a distance. And that's really uh, what I'm trying to go. That's where I'm trying to go with this painting. Now let's go ahead and paint in uh, just a little bit of information here. So the tiny brush strokes now, so a little bit of information there. There lives just a little tiny bit of light there, not trying to paint too much, just little bits of information here and there. Let's just soften that little edge a little bit with the brush stroke. And now you can really tell that most of the brush strokes are actually kind of in a diagonal fashion. And again, you know why they're in a diagonal fashion. So let's just touch up the little piece of the lower eyelid, just a little touch, just to make that edge a little bit softer and just make it a little bit lighter there. Very tiny little touches. Now let's go ahead and look at the edge close up. This is how I'm painting the edge, just kind of overlapping the flesh tone with the background. Now you can follow the brush stroke. Very simple, very easy. Just trying to cut into the background. And now we're just gonna apply just a little final touch here to this uh, shape on the side of the eye socket. I just wanna make this shape uh, just a little bit more sharp and that's going to be just about the final little touch that I'm going to want to do to this painting. And that is the conclusion of this portrait painting demonstration using the Zorn palette. And the Zorn palette again is my favorite limited palette but if you have another palette that you enjoy using uh, go ahead and type it down in the comment section below. I know it'll be very interesting dialogue to read between all of you. And I look forward to seeing you on the next painting video.